One September, uh, after the first day of school, one of our boys said, all they did today is tell us what we could and couldn't do. I mean, no institution can uh, survive without a code of conduct. Uh, rules and regulations are never meant to be amusing, uh, but sometimes they are. Maybe it's because they're supposed to be so all-fired serious, I find some of them downright hilarious. Listen to this one. In Danville, Pennsylvania, fire hydrants must be checked one hour before all fires. <laughs> Let's hope. In Seattle, it's illegal to carry a concealed weapon of more than six feet in length. <laughs> and Oklahoma law states that a driver of any vehicle involved in an accident resulting in death shall immediately stop and give his name and address to the person struck. Wow. A noise abatement piece of legislation was passed in Lakefield, Ontario, which permits birds to sing for 30 minutes during the daytime and 15 minutes at night. Hope they got their permission. Sometimes in our attempts to uh, keep uh, rules, uh, they become, it becomes humorous to the point of ridiculous because we don't understand the intent of the original guideline. Uh, with uh, our concerns about terrorism around the world and illegal immigration, uh, this story seems relevant. J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI, and uh, people uh, working for him always wanted to impress their powerful boss, and so one person was put in charge of the supplies for the FBI and trying to save some costs. Uh, he uh, made the office uh, memo paper a little smaller. Well, eventually uh, this paper got to uh, Hoover's desk and he took one look at it and he didn't like the, the margins around it, so he wrote a note on it, watch the borders. Well, for the next six weeks, it became nearly impossible to get into the United States from Canada or Mexico. The FBI was watching the borders. They thought they were following the guidelines of their boss, but uh, it was just uh, an innocuous note that he wrote. In contrast, God's commandments are neither ridiculous nor difficult to understand. Uh, this is the second in our series of messages, the original top ten, which we're looking at the new commandments, uh, the ten commandments uh, from New Testament eyes. Last week I, I looked at why the commandments are, are relevant uh, today. Let me, let me just uh, review three reasons. One, they give us absolute standards of right and wrong. I enjoy tennis. Let's suppose you and I went to play tennis and we went around the parks around here and we found the ones that have uh, tennis courts that were all full. So I said, well, Costco has a flat roof. Let's go up there. And so we set up our tennis, uh, our net, and uh, we decide the, the boundaries are the edge of the building, which means you could hit it in the corner and I maybe could get it back, but in doing so, I'd probably fall off the building. Um, because we don't have like a, chain, a 12 foot chain leak fence uh, to protect us, we would end up just playing kind of a cautious game around the net. Uh, God's commandments provide boundaries for us like a chain link fence. And as long as we stay within those parameters, we're safe and we're, we, can, we can live with abandon. And so God provides us with uh, absolute standards of right and wrong. Uh, after the people of Israel escaped from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and they got out into the wilderness, they had a choice. They could continue to follow Moses as the absolute monarch, or they could uh, decide to have no leader and slip into anarchy. God gives them a better way. Moses goes up the mountain and comes down with the Ten Commandments, uh, which functioned as uh, a code of conduct for them to live under. Uh, and all people, king and people, would be under the law. And these laws were not just for the people of Israel, but for foreigners as well, for all people born into this world. 
uh, the absolute standards of right and wrong. As international communication and uh, transportation has increased, our world has become a global village. We've seen the scramble in recent years for nuclear weapons in North Korea and Iran and the wars uh, that are being fought in Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, Yemen, Nigeria, and other places around the world. It's become pretty clear we need uh, uh, ethical standards that leaders around the world can agree on of what's right and what's wrong. If, if, uh, if a country does not abide by those, there will be consequences. And that's exactly what the Ten Commandments provide for us. Absolute standards from God for all people. Second, the Ten Commandments show us the greatest, uh, show us the way to our greatest good and happiness. The Ten Commandments reveal God's will for our lives. Uh, they show us uh, how we can experience the best life, uh, a good life. Uh, when people follow these commands, they discover uh, that uh, they, they find the best life. Uh, families come together. Uh, society functions best. You know, we do best in life when we don't uh, commit murder or adultery or steal or lie or covet. The psalmist who penned the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, writes of the happiness and fulfillment that we find when we follow God's commands. Blessed are they, uh, blessed means happy, blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. Then, and then later he writes, oh how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. This would be like spending time in, in the Bible, in God's word. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Uh, the, t the psalmist tells us that the way to happiness and, and fulfillment in life is to keep God's commandments. Far from taking away our happiness, the Ten Commandments are the way to real life. Uh, God delivered the uh, Ten Commandments to Moses on two stone tablets. Five were on the first one. They have to do with our relationship with God. And five are on the second one, our relationship with uh, people. Uh, the first commandment tells us uh, no gods, not to worship false gods. The second commandment, no idols, tells us to not worship the true God in a false way. The third commandment, no swearing. Um, you know, I've kind of listed all of these with just two words. When the original were given, they were just two words. The first word, lo, no, in Hebrew, and then what we're, you know, not to do. Uh, but it, it's kind of an oversimplification. If you look at these in Exodus 20, the commandments are, are spelled out in more detail. Third commandment tells us not to empty God's name of value by using his name in an unworshipful way. Fourth requires that we set one day in seven aside to worship God, to renew our relationship with Him. The fifth instructs us to honor our parents, uh, possibly, hopefully, uh, through whom we learn about God. The second half of the commandments uh, tell us how to love our neighbor, that we do best when we don't murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, or covet. Now, our hands can be... Uh, Visual aid, so would you hold your hands up, would you? So we've got two, uh, two tablets of the Ten Commandments. The first five have to do with uh, loving God with all our heart. The second five have to do with loving our neighbor. So we'll start with our thumb. I just want you to kind of, let's, let's say these uh, Ten Commandments. No gods, no idols, no swearing, no forgetting the Sabbath, no dishonoring parents with our pinky. Okay, here we go. The second half. No murder. No adultery. No stealing. No lying. No coveting. All right, now keep your hands up. Now we have no props on the PowerPoint. Can we do them by memory? Here we go. No gods. Idols. No swearing. No forgetting the Sabbath. 
No dishonoring parents. No murder. No stealing. No coveting. Very good. <clears throat> All right. Most surveys say that uh, most people in America do not know the Ten Commandments. They can't name even four out of the ten. You folks just got to the top of the class. Congratulations. All right, third, the Ten Commandments lead us to see our need for Christ. Now, some people think the Ten Commandments are a way to get into heaven. If we keep these, all that we can earn God's favor. They were never intended uh, for that purpose. When God gave the commandments to Moses, before he did that, he said, I am the Lord your God. Your God. He was saying, I'm, we already have a relationship You've already, you're already in. You don't have to do the Ten Commandments to get in. You already are, I already your God. And so God first gave His grace. He brought the people out of Egypt, and then He gave them the commandments. So the commandments are an expression, not to get into heaven, but they're an expression of God's grace. When we try to keep the commandments, we soon, we soon learn that we can't. We fail miserably, maybe all ten every week. Uh, this causes us to cry out to Christ for mercy and forgiveness. So the law reinforces uh, for us that salvation can only come through grace. We don't find salvation by keeping the Ten Commandments. They're an expression of how we live best with God and with other people. And they cause us to see our need for Christ and His forgiveness on the cross. Now, last week we considered the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, you can't fulfill this one by going around saying, oh, I can't worship this God, I can't worship that. You don't fulfill any of these commandments by the negative prohibition. Each of the commandments has two parts. The negative pro prohibition, you shall have no other gods, and the grand positive, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So the way to fulfill the first commandment is by loving God with our whole heart. Uh, Jory and I have a 15-year-old uh, a daughter, Erica, uh, goes to Wilson uh, High School, and uh, uh, she has, uh, has special needs. She has cerebral palsy, so uh, we have to help her with certain things. And uh, so I'm usually the one that puts her to bed. We kind of have a routine we go through. Uh, we uh, brush uh, her teeth together and put in her mouth guard, uh, wash her face, and then we go and we pray with Jory, and then uh, we hug, and then we kind of race for the bedroom because she has a little stuffed animal named Foxy who uh, she sleeps with at night, and I always try to get there ahead of her and, and grab Foxy, maybe stuff it down my t-shirt or sticking out of my pocket, and uh, Erica will soon find that and grab it back. And, uh, and then the last thing I do in bed is I, I kiss her somewhere. It's usually on her neck, or maybe I gobble down her back a little bit. And uh, but Erica just giggles through all this stuff. She's not afraid that I'm going to take Foxy. Or I'm going to take a big bite out of her. Uh, she knows I just do it as a way to express my love. And it's the same with God. There's sometimes we just want to express our love for God. So now we're ready for the second commandment. Let's, let's read this together. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. All right, you look at that commandment, and I bet your first reaction is, you know, I probably do pretty good at that one. I don't, I don't make idols, and I don't bow down in front of them. So, check. I, I do that one pretty well. But the interesting th thing is, is that uh, the writers of the Bible talk more about making no idols than any of the other nine commandments. And it's of the Ten Commandments, this is the second longest one. The, the longest one is honor your father and mother, and, and it goes on and on. Um, so why 
if we get this one and we, we meet this one so easily, do, do the writers talk more about this than any others? The second commandment sneaks up on you. It works like this. As you seek to love God with your whole heart, kind of grows up with it, kind of a desire to express that love for God in some way, and, and, and you want to make that, that love tangible. And so you think, well, maybe I, I could make something that would remind me of God. And you, and you make something that's going to remind you, it's not to replace God, but it, you, know, you, and you end up uh, worshiping that. Uh, it seems like it's, it's no problem. Why, what's wrong with making something that helps us remember uh, the God we worship? Uh, but God says, don't do that. No idols. Don't use anything to represent me. Uh, never represent the Creator by anything created. That's the basic rule. Not only are we not to make idols, but we're forbidden to bow down before them. Now, possibly the best way to understand this commandment is by looking at the way the Israelites first broke it. Uh, Moses went up Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God, and he was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, after a while, the people said to Aaron, his brother, where's Moses? Now, what's happened to him? Maybe he died up there. Remember, he's in a big cloud, and so they couldn't see anything. They said, make for us a God that can represent God that we can worship. So Aaron says, okay, give me your jewelry. Remember when they left Egypt, they, they kind of ransacked uh, the, the Egyptians. They all gave them pieces of gold, jewelry, and stuff. So they gave him, gave him their, uh, their rings and stuff, and, and he uh, put it in a fire and, and made this golden calf. Now, the intent was not to replace God, but... <clears throat> You know, it was to make something that they could worship, representing God. Seems like not such a big deal, but God was not happy. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down, <clears throat> because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bound down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So Moses goes down to see what's happened and hopefully set things right. And he says, Aaron, what happened? What did you do? He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that led you them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. This is his brother. He's kind of, you know, kissing up to him and don't be angry with me. You know how these people are prone to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. <clears throat> so I told them. Whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Wouldn't he fit in really well today? Never admit you're wrong. You know, just deny it. Blame somebody else. They made me do it. Why was God so angry? He knew that a bull could portray only a minuscule part of who he was. Maybe his power, but what about his love and his mercy and his holiness? God wants to be first in our lives. Idols usurp his rightful place. Then God adds, don't miscalculate my reaction to worshiping idols. He says, for I... The Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. He says that when we disobey his commands, a family pattern sets in that is passed down from generation to generation. It can take generations to rectify a family character flaw. Character flaws like idolatry, hatred, anger, insensitivity, sexual abuse, and addictions 
can be passed on from one generation to the next. One man and his family uh, was passed down to him an addiction to alcohol. He lived in Texas uh, with his family, and uh, he and his two brothers moved, uh, and, uh, and one moved to Arizona, and one moved to uh, Colorado, and he moved to Wyoming. He got to Wyoming, he came into a bar, and he ordered three mugs of Bud. And he went to the back, and, and, he, and he sat down, and he began to drink from each one, one at a time. And he'd go around again, and the bartender came to him, and he says, you know, when I draw a mug, it goes flat. You'd be better to just get one, you know, and then order another one like that. The guy said, well, my brothers and I are pretty close, and when we all moved from Texas, we agreed that we would keep a tradition like we had there of drinking together. So I'm really drinking uh, one for me, one for my other two brothers. Bartender thought that, that sounds like a pretty good custom, and so uh, he, he, he left. Well, this guy became a regular customer, and uh, every, you know, he'd come in and he'd order three mugs. And uh, well, one day he came in and he order, only ordered two. And the other regulars saw this and you know, fell silent, and bartender came over and says, I, you know, I don't want to intrude on your grief, but I just want to express my condolences. The guy looked at him like, what? And then he realized what he was talking about. He said, oh, really, everybody's fine? Brothers are all fine? I just, my wife and I joined the Baptist church, and I can't drink anymore. <clears throat> God says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, <clears throat> am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand of those who love me and keep my commandments. A God can break the cycle of these uh, sins, character flaws passed down from generation to generation. He can break the cycle. How can he break the cycle? He does so with his love. We break the cycle by loving him with our whole heart. Charles Colson was a member of uh, Richard Nixon's uh, uh, White House team. He got involved in Watergate. Some of you are too young to remember this, but uh, Colson went to, went to prison for that. And when he got out of prison, uh, he met a couple people who were Christians. And he began to consider Christian faith. He'd never grown up with it in his family and... Uh, and they talked to him about it, and he came to a uh, conviction that Jesus Christ really was the Son of God, and he was raised from the dead, and he gave his life to Christ. And then he was considering what he's going to do the rest of his life. He was about 40 at the time, and what was he going to do in the second half of his life? And he decided to start an organization called Prison Fellowship. At this point, they have 50,000 volunteers. They're in countries all around the world. And so one day he went to one of the prisons, and uh, he went to a, uh, it was a drug and alcohol rehabilitation class, and one of the uh, inmates was saying, you know, therapy just doesn't work. I've tried it, and this is my third time back in jail. Transformation is what I want. And so the inmates were happy to discover that there is a God, Jesus Christ is real, and he can transform our lives. He can transform our addictions, change our desires. And some of the inmates would actually uh, forego their parole in order to stay in the uh, addiction uh, thing to the end. Well, Colson was there for, uh, to hand out certificates to those who had completed this 18-month uh, course, and, and he was giving a certificate to one of the inmates, and he saw out of the corner of his eye a tall, dark woman got up and she came up to the front and she wrapped her arms around this guy and she announced to everybody, this is my adopted son. And he watched as hardened criminals and uh, tough staff people working in the prison, uh, tears came to their eyes. They were deeply moved because they knew this woman was the mother of the girl that this guy killed. Well, it wasn't easy for her to come to this point of forgiving him, uh, for 15 years, this guy, Ron Flowers, did not admit that he had killed this girl. 
And for 15 years, she would write a letter every year to the parole board and said, do not let this guy out on parole. He's a hardened murderer. And at the end of 15 years, meeting with the prison fellowship staff person, he finally admitted that he had committed this murder. And that same week, she was moved by God to forgive him. And she wrote a letter to the parole board saying, release him on parole. God's love, God's resurrection power can work in us to change us from the inside. He can transform us from the inside out. If He can change people in the darkest places like prisons, He can solve any problem in this world with His love. His love can break the cycle, pass down from generations. God forbids making of idols because they make God smaller than He really is. The idolater thinks, this thing I made... This thing I worship is God. This thing I live for. And what happens when we do that? The great transcendent God becomes squished down into a totally insulting imitation. And God doesn't want that. God wants to be first in our lives. Idols usurp His rightful place. You say, what are some examples of idol worshiping today? Probably lots of examples, but they're the idols of many religions in the world. Statues of Buddha, gods of Hinduism, the mosques of Islam, the gods of atheism like science, naturalism, and tolerance. It can be a church building, worshiping this. Closer to home, an idol is anything that replaces God in our affections. It can be a spouse, family, work. School, our hobbies, could be sports, can be beauty, can be addictions. What idols have you allowed to creep into your life? Anything that makes God smaller than He is, that limits Him in your thinking is an idol. God says, get rid of them. I want to be first in your life and don't want anything else to usurp my rightful place. The way to fulfill this commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this commandment. We thank you that we can understand that these commandments are not a way for us to earn our way into heaven. They are an expression of your grace, the best way to live, best way to live with you and to live with people. And that you've already shown your grace for us by sending your son to die for us. Showing us that you love us. These aren't the ways we get into heaven. Lord, we fail this one, making idols. We put other things ahead of you. Forgive us. And I want to give you a moment just now to, to talk to God alone, just privately where you're seated. Can you think of some idols in your life? Why don't you confess those, the things that may be ahead of God in your life? Uh, if you've never asked God to become God in your life and asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, you can do that right now and say, I believe that you were raised from the dead and I want you to come into my life. I'll give you all a minute to pray. Lord, thank you uh, for speaking with us. Thank you for uh, your word. And uh, we are sorry that we do make other things, higher priorities in our lives than you. Uh, forgive us, but thank you for your grace, that you love us and you forgive us and you sent your son to die for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.